Okay, welcome back. Um, so this session will go until half past 12, then we'll break for lunch. Um, we've, we'll go into some question and answers, but first we're uh, delighted to have Gwen Tala from the UK Independence Party. Um, I'm not sure what he's going to talk about, but over to you, Gwen. Thank you, Chris. Um, what am I talking about? Very good question. Uh, I'm officially, actually, even though it says UKIP here, I'm officially representing the parliamentary group, the European Freedom and Democracy Group. It's just a technical thing, but it means that I can get paid. It's quite important for me, I don't know. <laughs> it's quite important, that. Um, right. Uh, first, first, obviously, thanks for inviting me to uh, take up to Veal and to everybody. And uh, my thoughts go to somebody who will be talked about later, um, little man in Genoa. Uh, it's... Last time I saw him was this, year, this point last year, and I feel quite moved about that. But anyhow, I'm actually not going to talk about tobacco. I'm not talking about booze. In fact, I'm not talking about anything that's fun. Um, it's rather a shame. But even though this is a conference about prohibition, I want to talk about something a little bit different. It's linked. Make no bones about it. But it is not about those things that are prohibited. Um, this movement of ours, this coalition, this... Uh, desire to live a life without too much interference uh, that, is, that I think is what links everybody within the TICAP movement um, does create some strange bedfellows and the fellow that I'm in bed with at present I'd like to introduce you to is a chap called Dr. Wolfgang Wudarg or I'm not German so I'm probably pronouncing it appallingly badly now he's a German epidemiologist um, former head of health in Flensburg which is a rather nice little town um, but he's also a politician. Um, he's an SDP politician, and he sits on the... Uh, he's jumped upstairs, and he sits on the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which is the... Uh, another one of these various organisations that's being discussed earlier. Um, this one isn't nearly as bad as some of them, nearly as prescriptive as some of them. Uh, it generally talks about human rights and things of that sort, and sits in a vast concrete chunk in Strasbourg. But he runs the health committee, and he's the chairman of that committee. Um, to be frank, looking at him and looking at his various interests and everything else, he probably is the sort of chap that believes that moonshine creates daisies in the morning. Um, he's a bit odd in various ways, but he made a very good point. He, as the health chairman and the committee health chairman on the Council of Europe, pointed out that the whole panic with the H1N1 virus was driven as much by the pharmaceutical industry as by healthcare concerns. And suddenly people start nodding, oh yes, pharmaceutical companies. Um, in this case, it's mostly GlaxoSmithKline rather than Pfizer, but you get the general approach. And what he discovered was that what was essentially, and I think we're all, I, mean, I don't know how many of us have died here of um, swine flu, but not too many. Um, quite a few people got sniffles and sneezes, but the fact is that flu happens and you get flu, and in the case of this great swine flu pandemic, I mean, in Britain we think we had 250 people who died last year. 252, I think, is the full total so far of the whole swine flu pandemic. And um, normally we get about 1,500 who die of normal flu a year. So you can see, yes, it's serious, and for those who died, it, it's awful, and for the families and friends, it's dreadful. But this isn't something to panic about. This is something our normal systems are all right. Now, in the lead-up to the whole swine flu, fear, panic, masks, the works, I remember getting onto the tube one morning at, at 6 o'clock, and there was a bunch of Japanese tourists with their masks on. At 6 o'clock in the morning, they, they were the only people there apart from me. And I was coming back from a party. Um, but the, the whole point being that this fear which had been created over a period of time, and you were talking about the 10 years and all the rest of it earlier. Previously, we'd had av avian flu, hadn't we? And that was another fear. And the idea of pandemic has, has really, it's, a, it's an idea whose time has come and has been written about and headlined and all the rest of it. What is this pandemic? Well, the WHO, in its wonder and glory, changed the rules about what a pandemic was a few years back. And so instead of being something that had a specific percentage of a given population, uh, it became a, a pandemic was a disease of which we do not have cure that can be transferred from person to person, a human pandemic. 
That's, all, that's a hell of a lot of stuff. Now, governments had already bought in a bunch of this Tamiflu stuff. And then, after aviation flu, the large pharmaceutical firms signed what are called fixed and forward contracts. They're, um, they're sealed contracts. If a pandemic occurs, a government necessarily has to purchase vast quantities of a drug that, please note, as you change drugs, the new bits are, uh, have copyright on them. So therefore, these, these become extremely interesting to your pharma firms. But they have to buy these vast sums of this drug, um, come what may. Because the WHO is described as a pandemic, the member state governments therefore have to bring in their processes of these sealed contracts with the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. This meant that in the UK, and I, and I don't know every country, and I'm sorry to not to be wiser than that, but in the UK alone, the NHS and the government was forced to buy a billion pounds worth of Tamiflu. It used somewhat around the areas of about 25 million pounds worth. <coughs> and has been spending the last six to nine months desperately trying to sell huge, huge, huge quantities of this stuff because it wasn't necessary. They closed down their panic line, they closed down this, that and the other, and they're left with this massive cost, massive spend. Now, if we think, that's about 2% of bailing out Greece. That's a huge sum of money. Um, and our healthcare system, like most healthcare systems in this world, are a bit strapped for cash. Now, a billion pounds being spent on a drug when the actual healthcare system itself is in such, under such financial pressure is a colossal waste of money. How, how could this have happened? And it basically happened because, and I'm not blaming them, the pharmaceutical companies went along to the governments and said, ooh, you're, this WH is very scary. You must to protect your people, and if you don't, we'll go to the papers and tell them that you're not protecting your people, and we'll scare you through headlines, you must sign up to these contracts. So the pharma companies had a massive financial interest in creating and exploding a massive scare. Now again, the, the corollary with the prohibition case, corollary with Pfizer and the smoke for Europe and Nicorette patches and God knows what else, the corollary for various other things are very, very apparent. I don't need to explain to you what they are. I mean, we know that the farm industry has been pushing through lobbying and through elsewise and through just pure financial sense it's pushing for this. And as I said, I don't think you can necessarily blame the pharmaceutical industry. And I've got this lovely thing here from, from Pfizer talking about how it, how it is going to protect us from ourselves. And it makes a, a clear point that uh, it, it, its interest, what are they there for, um, is to... Our purpose is helping people live longer, healthier, and more productive lives. No, they're a company. Their purpose is to make money for their shareholders. I mean, get real. Now, we want the pharma companies to do well, because after all, we do fall ill of all sorts of things, and we want them to create the drugs and the medicines that allow us to live long, productive, and healthy lives. That, that is absolutely true. However, we must be wise to the process by which this happens, the process by which governments find themselves spending vast amounts of our money on things that aren't strictly necessary. 